throughout the Lenten season, we've been reading in the Gospel of John, but we are in the liturgical year where the majority of the readings come from the Gospel of Matthew. So this morning, we return back to the Gospel of Matthew and read the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. In the Gospel of Matthew, and you remember that these Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all tell this story, but in the Gospel of Matthew, <coughs> Palm Sunday is the first time where it is recorded that Jesus goes to the city of Jerusalem. And for this disciple of Jesus, as he tells this story, Matthew seems to understand clearly that Jesus knew that his ministry would not be complete. It would not be successful unless and until he took the gospel message from the small towns of Galilee, which was in the northern part of Israel, and declared it in the great temple in Jerusalem. Jesus has spent three years teaching and preaching, healing in small villages and towns like Capernaum, Nazareth, and Bethsaida. <coughs> it's kind of equivalent to a baseball player playing in the minor leagues who's hoping to get recognized and moved up to the major leagues. Or an entertainer whose career is not yet complete and they small they play in those small venue, venues and make fun of themselves for being in small venues until they get called up to Broadway. Jesus didn't seek that kind of thing, but he understood clearly that the message must be proclaimed and fulfilled in the holy city of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was a metropolitan city. There were <coughs> numerous ideas and Every new philosophy somehow would end up in Jerusalem. If you were to study the New Testament and the trajectory of the gospel message, you would see that the gospel message came from small places, went to Jerusalem here for Jesus' death, burial and resurrection. And then after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, and Peter first takes the gospel message, staying centered in Jerusalem, and then as we read the New Testament, we know Paul takes it from Jerusalem out to the small cities and villages of the known world of that day. would be like Jesus coming to Roswin, Lake Toxaway, Quebec. You know where Quebec is, right? <laughs> or Quebec if we're local. <laughs> and finally going to Raleigh, where the traffic lines are crowded, and where the cultural exchanges are more frequent. And indeed, if you and I wanted to run an ad in a newspaper to obtain maximum exposure, my apologies to the Trap family, I respect them immensely. But if I wanted maximum exposure, if I wanted it in Transylvania County, I don't even know that I would use the Transylvania Times because it just goes by word of mouth. If 
And I might place an ad in the Citizen Times, the News Observer, the Atlanta Constitution, or if I really wanted maximum exposure, the Wall Street Journal. Jesus understood that his ministry would come to its culmination in Jerusalem. <coughs> he seems in Matthew's Gospel to have been clearly focused on getting to Jerusalem and understanding that in going to Jerusalem, as we read last week, in the Gospel of John, as he went to Bethany, which was very close to Jerusalem, recognizing that he would be captured by the religious authorities and by the Roman authorities, and that his ministry would come to its culmination. And here we are on Palm Sunday. Today, Jesus sets his face directly to the temple. And the story really kind of boils down to two groups of people. There were some in the crowd who recognized Jesus and who knew who he was. And they were the ones who lined the street. They were the ones who laid down palm branches and who proclaimed, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But there were others in Jerusalem that day who had no idea who Jesus was. And it's important to remember that this was the the time of the approaching holiday, a combined holiday of the Passover and the holiday of unleavened bread. And so there were pilgrims from all over, Jews, who had come to Jerusalem. And some of those Jews from other regions may not have yet heard of Jesus. And then Jerusalem, because of its cosmopolitan nature and because it was occupied by Romans, there were many people who, as those who lined the road as Jesus approached Jerusalem, there were many people who had no idea and who, in fact, were asking, who is this? Who is he? And Jerusalem at that time, some of you who traveled to the Holy Land, you learned this, but how many gates were there? There were 12 gates at that time, representing 12, 12 tribes. tribes of Israel. Jesus <coughs> entered a specific gate. Legend has it that gate is now sealed and closed, awaiting Jesus' arrival in the second time, the second coming. But many on that day were saying, who is this? Now, this will seem trivial to you as I try to make a comparison, but I've just been to Gatlinburg. <coughs> Just got back last night at 11 o'clock. I officiated at a wedding of a young woman who was six when I went and served in the first church I served, and who is, she is a twin, and she is the more determined of the twins, although her sister is a successful PhD. But um, Heather called me about this time last year and said, you know I'm 36. No, I really don't want to hear that you're 36. <laughs> and I have never married. And I have met 
someone I love very much and I want you to officiate. Remember, I asked you as a little girl if you would officiate at my wedding. And I have to tell you, when I heard that she had chosen Gatlinburg because her parents had moved to Sevierville, I thought, oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Uh, and on Friday, as I drove in on the parkway, not the not the smoky, not, not the parkway we know, but in Gatlinburg, there's a road called the parkway. As I drove in, and my GPS is telling me that I am only three miles away from the hotel where they have made reservations for me, and it is taking me over an hour, and there are all these hot rides lined up on the side, and people sitting out in lawn chairs, and then there are other hot rods driving beside me. I am going, what <laughs> is this? <laughs> you know the first thing I did when I got to the hotel, I asked, how can I avoid this crazy crowd? Actually, they gave me some great back roads that if you ever go, there's no reason I know to go, but if you ever go, I'm happy to share them with you. My disdain for Gatlinburg would be equivalent to some of the disdain that the religious leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, others of influence had for Jesus. They would not have understood why the crowds gathered on the side of the road and held Jesus and announced his arrival with blessings to him who comes in the name of the Lord. those who with disdain were asking who is this? This country bumpkin from Nazareth. And as painful as that may be for our ears to hear, Imagine that there were many people in Jerusalem who did have that kind of attitude towards his arrival. They did not understand why he was receiving a king's welcome. And I suspect, in fact, I know that our, our response in the year 2014 after the arrival of Christ on that first Palm Sunday, our question may be the same. Who is this man. In the 21st century, there is an increasing disdain for Jesus. We are people who are interested in being sensitive to the varieties of spiritual expression. In fact, I sat at a table at the reception last night beside the man and woman who played an acoustical guitar and the wife sang beautifully. And they said, you know, we used to think chaplains weren't Christians, but we now work with one. And we have found that even though he has to work with people of all kinds of backgrounds, 
He embodies Jesus to all kinds of people. And I looked at him and said, thank you for saying that, whether you mean it or not. But who is Jesus? Many people avoid his name, avoid proclaiming it. And I don't want to be disrespectful of others, but I do say this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock. sisters and brothers. There are so many people who ask, why did you go to church this morning? Why do you reenact in this coming week events that are dark terrifying and depressing? Why do you focus your attention so clearly on all that occurs? And our response should be quick. He is the Son of God. He is the architect of the whole creation. The victor for us over sin, hell, and death. He is the second person of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The mighty counselor, the God of Isaiah. He's the one that John the Baptist preached about in the wilderness. He is the one whose birth was foretold by the prophet Micah that it would take place in, Beth in Bethlehem. <clears throat> He's the one who loved whole floral shop would be named after the Rose of Sharon. That was meant to have some humor in there. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. The Lily of the Valley or the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Seriously? He is the Lamb of God whose blood to wash away all our sins. What other response could you and I make? That blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I love that royal, vibrant, powerful hymn. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem. You know who the royal diadem is? It's not some piece of jewelry. It is Jesus the Christ. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord, Lord of all. That's who Christ is. He is Lord of all. And he is my Lord.
And because every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection, he is risen from the dead. And he has conquered death once and for all, for all humanity, who seek him and who choose him as Lord and Savior. May you and I leave this place this day proclaiming Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And may we, along with Paul, say, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's who he is. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.